Let's go ahead and make, make our first jump. Full speed ahead. 100%. Make the jump. Charging frame shift drive. I also use keyboard shortcuts, um, so sometimes I'll give a verbal command for her to do something, and other times I will just hit a keyboard shortcut. But when I do, you'll hear her acknowledge that I did, so you'll be able to kind of keep up with me and know what I'm doing here. So whenever you go to a system, you always arrive at the star first, and uh, I'm going to tell, tell her to scan the star now. Do the scan. Scanning planet. I'm also using a keyboard shortcut to perform what's called an advanced discovery scan. You just heard it complete there, and it's telling me that two objects were found in this system. Open system map. System map. So the two objects that uh, were discovered are these two worlds here. You can zoom in a little bit on them. Now these are just icy worlds. I know those symbols pretty well. And uh, just so you know how I know that, I know it from here. Uh, I'm either looking down here at a rocky body or an ice body. They're a little hard to tell apart, um, but I can also look um, uh, well, let me, before I do that, let me just check and see what kind of a star class this is. So once I hover over it, I can read on the left that this is a class M star. And then I can come over to here and uh, I can look up class M at the bottom. So the habitable zone is 0.51 to 200.85 light seconds away from the star. And I can then close the map, close the map, closing map. And I can look at the symbols. The symbol to the left of the HUD down there is a star-like uh, uh, symbol. That's just letting me know that this M-class star is what I currently have selected. But then I can look in my navigation panel over here, and I can see what unexplored bodies there are in the system. Now, if I choose to explore them, there's two reasons to do that. One, of course, is to earn credits, <clears throat> you know, by, by um, going in and scanning these, these bodies, and then later on I can hand in that data and I get both, um, both some credit value for that in terms of the money, the in-game money they call credits, and I can also um, uh, get credit for being the first person to discover uh, the system and the bodies that it contains if indeed nobody else has been there. And the path that I'm following and have been following since I left the bubble, I've only, uh, I, I, every single system that I've scanned so far has been undiscovered. I mean there are billions of systems in the Milky Way galaxy. It's going to take about 30 years uh, at the current uh, rate that people are traveling around the galaxy to find them all. So there's plenty of unexplored uh, systems and planets here. I can select one of them and lock that as a destination and then the symbol to the left of the map changes and I am learning how to recognize those symbols or those holograms um, or what I sometimes refer to as uh, um, silhouettes and I can then compare those against this here and I know that that symbol very well it's an icy body so that means that we're looking at an icy body and system map system map system cartography if I then look at the icy body I can see to the upper right that it's 596 light seconds away from its host star, the M-class star here. Well, that's more than 200 light seconds uh, based on um, this, the 200 uh, light second maximum distance. So it's going to be 
out here beyond the habitable zone and that's going to make it a very cold and bleak and it won't be able to sustain life um, uh, or be terraformed. The other thing that you can also tell when you look at these maps is sometimes you're going to see a planet has a, a half circle of blue around it. That indicates that the planet has, that you can land on that planet. In the current state of the game, you cannot land on any planets that have an atmosphere. So if it has that half circle of blue around it, which isn't showing on this map, uh, but you'll see it as we move uh, forward here, then that means that there is no atmosphere and therefore the planet is not going to be a terraforming candidate. So if it has that semicircular blue ring around it, that means that it's not going to have that terraformable capability and it's not going to be a high value uh, scan. So um, those are some of the uh, some of the uh, tricks that I use and uh, you'll see me using them. You can see that this one is 15,654 light seconds away. Again, well beyond the habitable zone. Okay, uh, let's just go ahead and get on with this. So I'm going to use a keyboard shortcut to close that. And uh, because the distance of these two planets, uh, one of them is very close, 595 light seconds. I could get to that in a matter of a minute or so. This one, on the other hand, will take me probably about three minutes to get to because of its distance, is 15,000. And there's really no great value in this system, so I am not going to go and scan those. But instead, what I'm going to do is just scoop some more fuel off of this star. And you can see my fuel indicator on the right bottom right there. Um, you can see that it's about, oh, you know, um, about 75 or 80 percent full. But I'm going to go ahead and top off my tanks and then I'm going to move on to the next system. So I'm going to go ahead and set my speed here to about 25 percent. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, do this fuel scooping and you'll see me do that. So here we go. Understood. 25 percent. Next system in route. Locking system destination. Okay, so now here you can see at the top of the screen the two sets of numbers. The 63% represents how hot uh, the this, this star is, uh, how much heat that I'm you know, taking on. And then the fuel indicator is the rate that I'm scooping. I try to keep that when I'm scooping a planet or scooping a star right around 250. That usually prevents me from overheating. Full speed ahead. Maximum velocity engaged. I can start incurring heat damage once my heat gets much over 70 percent. Uh, at least, you know, just kind of like verging on it. But once you get to 80 percent, that's where you start uh, taking on a little bit of heat damage and you still have a little bit of leeway there once you get up over a hundred percent then the damage starts happening really rapidly and the amount of heat damage that I've taken on you can see here in my modules panel on the right hand side those percents that's the amount of health that I have for my various systems on board the ship so some of these have taken on more damage than others but generally uh, considering the uh, the distance that I've traveled I'm doing pretty well I I have incurred very little damage and that's because I've uh, developed good practices to try and keep myself from uh, harming myself uh, now before we make this next jump let me show you uh, one other thing here the, the, this is the uh, external camera that I can use for taking pictures or looking around outside the ship. This is me. I uh, have been trying to customize my avatar to look as much like me as I can. And although this is not a perfect um, uh, reflection of what I look like, it's not too bad. And so um, I just thought I'd show you that as well. So um, anyway, 
let's go ahead and move on to the next system. Maybe we'll have some better luck when we get there. Make the jump. Jumping. In the upper right hand corner you can see that this is a, going to be a Class M Red Dwarf Star. And so that information will come in handy. We, we're just at a Class M. And you may recall that the habitable zone is 0.5 up to 200 light seconds away from that star. So knowing that, when I get there, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, do a detailed uh, or do a, an advanced discovery scan and also scan. Oh, Stop all thrusters. And I was starting to rush into the plant to the star there, so I hit the X key on my keyboard to stop my engines. Normally, um, um, Astra, my, uh, my kind of disembodied voice on the ship, um, will do that for me, but occasionally, and uh, as of late yesterday, she seemed to have stopped doing that most of the time. I don't know why. So I had to manually stop the ship myself. So you can see I'm, I got close enough before I stopped that I'm already starting to scoop fuel up on top. So I'm just going to go ahead and scan the star. Scanning now. And I'll go ahead and grab my advanced discovery scan, which takes kind of a big picture of the system that I'm in and lets me know how many planets or astronomical objects there are. I found 24 of them. Now I'm going to say system map, system map, System cartography. And now I can look at this system. We'll take a broad view first. So here you can see there's a host star, which we know is a class M star. And you can see that on the left. And then the planets. And the nearest one is this gas giant, which is 969 and some change light seconds out. Again, that's beyond the habitable zone. And if I kind of get in here and take a look up a little bit more closely to see if there are any planets in here that I might want to visit anyway, just to collect uh, credits. Fuel uh, complete. She just finished get, getting the fuel. I can. Uh, I know these different symbols mostly. This is going to be probably an icy world because of its distance out from the star. Uh, this may be either a rocky planet or possibly a high metal content world, um, which has more value than the icy worlds. But in general, there's really nothing in this system that entices me much. Um, looking at these gas giants up here, those symbols, I can compare those here. Oop, went one too far. And the gas giants are all up top here. And then I can just compare those images to see if there's anything here that uh, has much value. It looks like I've got a class one gas giant in one of those. That would be the one in the middle, the kind of the brown one. That looks a lot like this one here in the class one gas giant category. And uh, this lighter colored one here, um, that is also most likely, let me make sure about this, yeah. Um, these, again, these colors are not a perfect match, but I've kind of gotten accustomed to this. Most likely another uh, a class one gas giant. So really nothing there. Now I know this one, uh, this purple one pretty well. This is a class one uh, gas giant as well. Um, this one right here. It's the most common type. I run into those a lot. It's called a, a class one Sadarsky or a Sadarsky class one gas giant, uh, which are also listed over here um, uh, in the in these guys here. And a class one means that it's a gas giant with ammonia clouds. You can't land on those or fly through their atmospheres in the current iteration of the game. So. There's really no great reason to, um, to visit any of those. So again, I'm going to close this map, and I'm going to just continue on to our next system using the same yes, method as sir. before. Yes, 25%. I've 
we've already done the scooping. So next waypoint. Next waypoint. Next system, please. She hasn't been understanding me very well lately. Let's try it again. Next system. Selecting next destination. Okay, there we go. All right, now I, to the left of my map, you'll see that there's kind of a little targety thing, and there's a little white dot on the right-hand side of it. That is what I can use to align myself to my target. So if I can come around and just kind of come on up on it like this, and then full speed ahead. Maximum drive. Make the jump. Preparing for jump. And we're going to go to a class K, a yellow orange star. This is another common star type. We can look down here at the class K's. Hyperspace. Checking systems now. And that's going to be 107 to 480 light seconds. Uh, for the habitable Stand by. Stop system scan. Stand by. Do the scan. Scanning. System map. System map. All right. Now this looks a little more interesting here. So we've got our primary star is a class K. You can see that on the left. Underneath that is probably a class M. And it, okay, I was right about that. And um, the one below that is a gas giant. And then down below that looks like another class M. And it also has some rather interesting worlds. And this one out here is the most interesting of all. That looks like an Earth-like world. Now, one of the problems, we're going to go explore this system. So we're going to spend some time here. One of the, um, one of the problems in the current iteration of the game and this system map that we're looking at is that it only gives uh, the distance away from the primary host star, the, the one that we arrived at. These other stars can have their own planets <clears throat> orbiting them. Uh, and those stars in turn are orbiting around the, the main parent host star. But the distances that they give down here you can see are very large, like 4,000 light seconds and uh, 3,000, is that what that says? 3,000 light seconds, and 4,000, and 4,000, and 4,000. And the reason that those, those numbers don't really matter here is because those are the, that's the distance that these are from the main parent star, not from the star that they are closest to and orbiting. So, when I saw this, what looked like an Earth-like or water world-looking uh, planet, I don't know whether or not it's close enough to this star to be habitable. And the only way that I can know that for sure is to fly up to this star and then look at the distances of those bodies that orbit it from that relative location, which we'll do when we get to that star. Now the uh, last thing that I uh, always check over here is the distance from the host star to all of its unexplored uh, inhabitants here. And so I'm going to just scroll down until I get kind of the last one and see that distance of 9,108 light seconds. I know that that is the, the distance from this star that I'm at right now to that particular body, which is the most distant body. Uh, this uh, list, you'll notice, uh, puts things in order of, of relative distance from the host star, from the main star that we just came to. 
However, um, those distances can be deceiving because when the planets are in orbits, that means that they can be at any number of distances depending on where they are in their circular orbit around the star because that can change their relative distance to the host star or to their own their own local parent star. So it may take uh, take a little while and I expect we're going to probably be in this system here for about 40 minutes or so. So we've already got scan data on this main star. I did that when we got here. So it's telling me that this is BLE E, A, E, C, etc. Um, th the rest of them are currently marked unexplored and we're just going to go to those in order. So we're going to start with this one. We'll lock the destination to that and I'll go ahead and scoop Understood. before I go. I always do scooping before, before um, leaving the host star. It's always good to kind of keep your tank topped off. So I'm going to get that fuel, that rate of fuel scooping up to somewhere in the 250 percent range, or 250 um, uh, units of fuel per second. Doesn't have to be exact, but the higher the number, the faster I do the scooping. And the bottom right shows me filling up. And now I can um, go ahead and make sure that I've selected that next star. Okay, I have, and it's around uh, behind me and uh, kind of off to the other side of the star. So I'm going to increase. Maximum velocity engaged. I'm going to increase my speed using a keyboard shortcut this time, and I'm going to come around and I'm going to have to go under this star, which is just overhead here. Go clear that baby first. And then I can kind of come around and aim myself at this first planetary body. And I'm going to just stop Cutting right here. Stop here. And the reason is, is because the one that I'm getting right now is another star. This is the other class M star. You can now see on the left that I'm picking up the scan data. So these two stars are very close to one another. I mean, they're, they are, uh, you know, a, a stellar pair, as they're sometimes referred to, and which is very common. Most stars have um, uh, stellar companions. Um, usually one is a dominant. Okay, now this, uh, this holographic image to the left, I know that image pretty well. That is, um, that is a, uh, one of two possible types. It could either be a high metal content or a rocky body. And just for reference, you can see it here. It's that one down there. Um, and we can now look at its distance from the host star to kind of get a sense of where that would be. So we'll go to the uh, system map. System cartography. And then when I look on the system map, you can see up here that yellow triangle is pointing at the current body that I have selected. If I hover over it, I can see that that's 113 light seconds out. And that uh, 113 light seconds falls nicely within that 107 to 480 range. So that one is potential, has the potential, um, well, it, it's not going to be terraformable or habitable because it's got that little blue circle, a semicircle around it. So uh, it's not going to have any, it's not likely to be habitable or terraformable and therefore not as high a value, but it's most likely either a high metal content or rocky body, uh, according to that silhouette that we looked at. Um, if you look here, you can see that there are these yellow bars that are uh, enclosing groups of planets. So all of the ones that are enclosed by this bar on the right um, are um, could, could be a high metal content and or 
a, a rocky body because some of these share, um, you know, uh, in both categories. So, um, you know, looking at uh, this one here, we're looking at this one right down here, and that one could be, in this case, either a high metal content or a rocky world. Um, some of these others here we can look at while we're looking at them because these are all close to the host, the main host star. This one here um, has the potential of being uh, most likely a high metal content and because it doesn't have that blue semicircle it could also be terraformable. And that may be a high value um, planet, we'll find out. This one out here is at 341 which is still within the, the 400, I believe the uh, 480 uh, light second range. Oops. And so uh, this one could definitely um, also be terraformable or habitable. Uh, this one here, um, it's within range. That could be terraformable. This one as well could be. But once we get out to this one here, that's going to be outside the habitable range. So just uh, in terms of this one star that we're going to uh, look at all of its planets, um, you know, uh, we're definitely uh, within range um, and could conceivably make some good bucks or credits off of those. Uh, this one down here we'll get to probably at the very end of uh, our look at the system. Let me select it and I'll zoom in on it a bit. But as you can see, that looks like an earthy water world to me. And we can do a little comparison over here. That may be a water world. This one here, it's got a little polar ice cap. It could also be an earth-like world like one of these down here, which are the highest value ones. You see in green, that's, those are the highest values that you can earn on those. And so we'll have to wait and see when we finally get there. Um, although it is possible within the game to kind of get a, a, an early sense of that. If I select that one here and then pop back out, I can see from this holographic image here that this is an Earth-like world. I know that symbol because these are rare. So chances are I'm going to make big bucks and discover my fourth Earth-like planet and you're going to get to see me do it. Um, but we'll have to wait to get there. I can show you what that silhouette looks like here. Um, have to scroll down it's this silhouette down at the bottom. Now it could also be an ammonia world. We'll have, it will depend really on whether it's in the habitable zone or not. An ammonia world is also valuable and that's because in the game there's an alien species known as the Thargoids and we're at war with the Thargoids. They apparently originate from ammonia worlds and so it's it's valuable information in game to know where the ammonia worlds are because those are potentially where our enemies uh, live. Uh, and of course earth-like worlds being the most valuable of all. Um, well actually water worlds can, can also be very very valuable. Um, so um, anyway let's just get back into the game here. Enough chit chat for a while. So I'm going to go ahead and just select the very first uh, the, the very first planet, we've already done the, the two stars that were close to one another. So now we're going to go ahead and uh, head out to the, the first uh, planet here in the system. So Understood. 25%. Maximum drive. Now I'm going to close the distance. You can see the, that uh, little counter counting down quickly. When that gets to about nine seconds or so, 50%. I drop my speed down to 50%, and that keeps me from overshooting. The silhouette on the left, remember, tells me that this is either a water, uh, that this is a high metal content or rocky body. 
You can see on the far left the scanner is doing a scan right now and when it's done it will pop up there and also up on the top where I've got um, uh, captain's log and that's just telling me that that is a high metal content HMC means a high metal content world we'll take a quick look at it here um, it doesn't have any atmosphere it is landable and the gravity there is 0.36 uh, G which means it's 0.36 of Earth's gravity and then all those minerals are available there. You can also see on the far right at the top the estimated system value. So as we continue to scan the system understood 25% as we continue to scan the system that uh, number in yellow up there on top will continue to increase letting us know how much we've earned uh, while we've been visiting this one system. And if I had an SRV I could land on this planet and drive around and go around and harvest materials, but uh, right now I don't have an SRV, so I can't. Uh, the last thing up on top there is on the far right under the yellow uh, estimated system value, it says J1. Now J stands for Jumponium, which is just a, a kind of a slang term that's used by players in the game uh, for certain uh, minerals that are um, usable to increase your ship's jump range. In other words, the total distance that your ship can travel. 100%. So I'm increasing my speed now and I'm going to head off to the next one. And Jumponium, um, um, you know, can, uh, depending on the, on the quality of the Jumponium that you find, the various different ju uh, Jumponium minerals, it's entirely possible to uh, increase your jump range in a single jump uh, by as much as 100%. So uh, explorers use Jumponium occasionally, especially when they need it and they're in parts of the galaxy where the stars are really far apart, where you need uh, the extra jump range in order to make it to the next star uh, where you can scoop uh, you know, minerals. Now because this is a Jumponium based planet, I like to keep a note about it, like I put here. So I'm just going to copy that, keep it in my paste buffer, and paste it right into my current system so that I am keeping track of that information. And uh, this is counting down pretty quick here, so once it gets down to around 9 or between 9 and 7, seconds I'll lower my speed to 50% coming up in 3, 2, 1 and here Engaging we go. Now. 50%. That'll keep me from overshooting. You can see from the silhouette on the left that is I believe a rocky body if I'm not mistaken and uh, let's see if I was right about that. No, that's a um, uh, well it could be a high metal content or a rocky body because it falls inside both of those yellow brackets there. And I got the scan data on it. You can see up top another high metal content world. So my estimated system value has increased again. And uh, we'll uh, go to the next one uh, on the list, which is its moon, which is right over here. I point my ship at it and it does an automatic scan. And that too is either a high metal content or rocky body. Now, considering their proximity to the star, most of these would be a high metal content just because they're so close to their star. 25% engaged. I just slowed down so I don't run into the planet. And I've just selected the next one, which is either a high metal content or a rocky body. Maximum drive. And I increased my speed so that we can get there more quickly. Understood. 50%.
Okay, another high metal content world. Okay, and this could also be either a high metal content or a rocky body. Maximum velocity engaged. Okay, 50% engaged. I use two types of scanners uh, when I'm doing es exploration. As I mentioned, one of them is called the Advanced Discovery Scanner. And that is the one that, that once you arrive at a system, if you have the Advanced Discovery Scanner and you engage it, it will gather general data about the whole system. It'll let you know how many bodies are in there and things like that. Another high metal content one. Okay. And this one has a moon, so we'll grab that as well. Again, another high metal content or rocky body. The other type of scanner is the one that I that engages once I get close enough for it to work. You can get upgrades on your scanner so that uh, you can uh, get, get your scan data at farther distances, but which I've already done. But still, once you get within range, an, an advanced discovery scanner will automatically scan the planet as long as you're pointed at it. Okay, this, uh, this particular symbol here, I believe, uh, is um, I think that's an uh, an ice planet if I'm not mistaken. But let's take a look here and see. Um, no, no, no. It's this one up here. That's a high metal content world. It's not either or because it's just inside the bracket for high metal content. But definitely a high metal content world. And system map. System map. If we look on the map here, we can see. Oh, uh, let me. See if I can get pointed at it here. So this one is within the uh, habitable zone, and uh, it's not landable, which means it's going to have some kind of an atmosphere. So it could be potentially a terraformable world. So we'll find out about that here in a moment. Fifty percent speed. And it's got a little moon right next to it. You can see that as well, which may also have the same possible uh, terraforming. Yeah, and it is. It's a terraforming candidate. So uh, you can see that uh, my estimated system value just jumped considerably. And um, we'll select its moon and do a scan on that right there and then let's go take a look at that terraforming candidate up close shall we 25 sir and that one's just a rocky body okay so coming back here to this one here that we just did let's get in closer and we'll get a good look at it and one of the things that I like to look at with these is uh, I like to understand the, uh, the atmospheric content of the planet, knowing what kind of atmosphere it has and how I might be able to differentiate the different types just by the coloration that they uh, provide can make a, quite a difference. And so I'm going to just get in here close and we're going to look along the, the very edge where you can see through the, uh, the atmosphere uh, best and uh, look at the color of it and that kind of thing. So I'm going to stop my engines here. Stop full of thrusters. And um, let's look at the information about this one here. So um, I can just go ahead and uh, select it again so that we can see it on the system map. <clears throat> System map. System cartography. All right, now let's go up and take a look at that, and we'll get all the uh, all the detailed information that uh, is available now on the left. Now that I've done the scan, I can see a lot more information about it. 
So its earth mass uh, information is always useful. Uh, that's uh, you know 0.18 of uh, the mass of the earth and its surface temperature is 352 degrees Kelvin and if I launch my little calculator down here I can do a, a quick um, calculation I can just enter Kelvin 352 and then that would tell me what the Fahrenheit would be so 173.9 degrees Fahrenheit or 78.85 degrees centigrade so that uh, is telling me what the average surface temperature is on the planet uh, the other thing that I can tell when I go back into the uh, to the game here on the left is the atmospheric type and the uh, the composition of the atmosphere and uh, the um, let's see I'm looking for the atmospheric density there where is that um, this one isn't giving the um, the atmospheric density. Knowing the atmospheric density can be a very uh, can be a great help. So this is where I could also look in Captain's Log, and if I select that one, which is this one right here, I can see here that it may have more information. Um, Uh, let's see. No, it doesn't give the it doesn't give the atmospheric density. Sometimes you can get that. Atmospheric density lets you know, um, you know, how many pounds per square inch uh, on the surface of the planet um, the the atmosphere is relative to Earth at sea level. Earth's atmosphere at sea level. The higher that that number, the more it affects the color. That the gases in the atmosphere um, uh, have in determining, you know, what the coloration um, might look like, and so I just I'm using all this information so that I can try and learn how to make these evaluations uh, quickly. Of course, when I'm talking about it like I'm doing now, that wastes gobs of time. But if I was just doing this. And if I just had this information in my head, um, which eventually I will, you can look up, look at the edge of the planet here, and you can see the color that this carbon dioxide, mostly carbon dioxide and some sulfur dioxide, um, does to the surface of this planet, which is otherwise uh, being high metal content. That means it's going to be, uh, you know, mostly rock with a lot of metals. Um, you know, uh, you know, in the geology of the planet. So that was a real good find. And uh, if we pop back over here for a moment uh, into uh, ED Discovery, um, which is a third party, or just like um, um, the Captain's Log, or both third party apps that integrate with the game, you can see that now in three jumps and 99 light years and 11 scans I've already earned 508,183 uh, credits which is half already of what I earned yesterday in 74 scans and 5 jumps so um, a captain's log can give you a lot of information for example I can um, I can go over here to this grid where you can configure things and it'll tell you um, more information about uh, the planets that you visited and um, stuff like that. I'm still learning how to use uh, ED Discovery here, so... Okay, anyway, I'm talking again instead of playing, so let's, let's move on to the next one here. Although, maybe before I do, let's jump outside and take a look, shall we? So, I'm just jump out here, take a look around. Let's look at our beautiful planet there off to our. I'm afraid that's classified information. <laughs> she gets confused sometimes and 
says things, she thinks that I said something that she had something to say about it. Oh, look out there, there's a, uh, there's a comet. I wonder if I can go visit that. <laughs> I've never seen a comet before in the game. Um, let's turn around and take a look at that. myself in the right direction here. All right. Where was that? Where was that comet? Is it up over here? I saw I saw that thing. You saw it, didn't you? Um, but I'm not spotting it here. Maybe it's on this side. If it's there, I wanted to go look at that. But I'm not seeing it now. But I saw it when I was outside. How weird. That would have been kind of behind me over this way somewhere. Right, and then we were looking off in this direction here somewhere. Where was that exactly? I'm trying to recreate that kind of view that I had there. But I don't see it now. In the um, in the new version that's coming out this year, um, which will be coming out in stages, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, give me a second. One hundred percent. Um, they're going to be adding in the new in the in the new. Uh, this year, somewhere in the next four updates, are gonna, they're planning on doing this year. They're going to be adding um, a whole bunch of new uh, space anomalies, probably cometary bodies would be one maybe. Uh, they haven't told us what, but they're going to add a whole bunch of new anomalies and uh, more planetary features and all kinds of uh, new stuff to see and explore and to enhance uh, the user experience. Um, who knows, maybe comets will be amongst them. So, uh, I don't know why they had that one there, and then it disappeared. Anyway, getting on with this, looking at that, uh, that uh, holographic image there to the left, um, that could be uh, an ice world. I don't remember what that is. It's an, um, no, that's a, that is a high metal content. It's a high metal content or a rocky body because it's inside both of those yellow brackets. High metal content or rocky body. Uh, yeah, that's the one I was looking at. Now this one will be, I believe, outside of the habitable zone. System map. System map. That one um, up there is outside of that habitable range. Well, just outside. 603. Close the map. Closing the map. Um, we're looking at class K. But 480, yeah, it's outside of the habitable zone. So not likely to be terraformable. Hmm, look at those guys. Too late. <laughs> That's, uh, that was those two stars. Actually, let's, just take, let's just take a look at those from a distance. So there they are. Now they're right now they're kind of out of alignment. Let's um, let's 
100%. Let's move ahead a little bit so that we can kind of see them at a different angle. There we go, that's better. 25, sir. So you can see how close they are to one another. And uh, one is basically orbiting the other one. And they're both class M stars. Or class Ks. Sorry, they're both class Ks. We can reference that up here. You can see where it says stars. The first one we hit was the class K and then its smaller companion is a class M. Stop for thrusters. So there you can get a good, good look at them. Okay, let's go ahead and move on now to our rocky body or high metal content world. Maximum velocity engaged. When you're looking out, out this window and you see these uh, these kind of partial brackets, you know, surrounding them, like like this these guys up here and that guy, that just means those are not stars; those are uh, planetary bodies or potentially other stars that are within the system. Understood. Fifty percent. Okay, now I dropped my speed to fifty percent a little bit too early. I'm going to overshoot this before my speed drops. So I'm going to have to come back around here for to get some scan data on it. Yes, sir. 25%. So this one isn't going to be terraformable, but it could definitely be a high metal content or rocky body. And it's high metal content. So, you know, we've already made more than half a million credits just on this one system, and we haven't yet gotten to that Earth-like one, so that's going to be really valuable once we get there. In fact, we're going to head in that direction right now. Maximum drive. You can see that symbol on the left there is another star, and there were three stars in this system, so this has got to be the last star, and we've got to travel 3,581 light seconds to get there. But the star is large enough that we can already get, grab that scan data on the star itself. The planets that are going to be orbiting it are the ones that we're most interested in, especially the last one in the group. And, um, and we'll definitely be looking forward to that. And so that star we just scanned was another class of M. So now I'm going to choose whatever the nearest body in that little system around that star happens to be. And it could be uh, the Earth-like one right away, or it might not be. And it's not. This is a, um, this one that we're looking at right now, system map. System cartography. You can see where that yellow triangle is. So that's the one that we're currently closest to from our current location. So we're going to go grab the data on that first. By the way, in the background there, that uh, gas, gaseous looking thing, what you're seeing there is the large Magellanic Cloud, and the one to the left of it there uh, is the small Magellanic Cloud. Both of those are um, They're outside of this galaxy. I believe they're out, out, of, out of the galaxy. Uh, I, I actually have to go look them up again. Um, I think they're clouds of stars, kind of like small, small little mini galaxies that are um, part of our galactic uh, family. Um, 
the group, 50 percent speed the group of galaxies that we're a part of in this part of the universe i believe that those are um, galactic objects but to tell you the truth i'm not 100 percent sure about that i have to go look it up if i want to know get the scan data and maybe we'll just go look that up real quick. Twenty five percent engaged. Drop, drop my speed for a moment and go back here to my web browser and open another tab. Large and small M E M E G A L A. See the clouds are there down there, and I got my caps lock on. Magellanic clouds um, are two irregular dwarf galaxies, yeah, visible in the southern celestial hemispheres. They're members of the local group and are orbiting the Milky Way galaxy because they both show signs of a bar structure. They are often reclassified as Magellanic spiral galaxies. Okay, there we go. So now we know. And this is a high metal content with a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. And we should be able to get a pretty good sense of the color of carbon dioxide on this one if we get close enough to look at its, uh, get an edge on a look of, of its atmosphere. I believe the carbon dioxide is kind of a brownish gray when it, depending on its density, of course. Um, but it says hot, thick carbon dioxide up there on the top. So it's going to be thick. So an edge on look could help give us a little bit of a clue about that. We'll look up along here so we don't get too much direct reflection or refraction from that starlight. So it's kind of a, a brownish gray color. That's sort of what I would say we're looking at here. All right, let's move on. Okay, this is going to be another high metal content or rocky body. Maximum velocity engaged. And uh, judging by that appearance, does it have any moons? No, but it may have companions that are close at hand. Let's see. You know, when you look at the system map and you see all the planets in a nice straight line, um, their relative distance from, from the star is based upon their absolute distance, not their relative distance. In other words, if you put them all in a line, that would be what their distances are from the star. But as they're all orbiting the star, they could be from one another um, even a greater distance away. You know, if like one is on one side of the star and the other one is on the opposite side of the star, you'd have to add their two distances from the, from the main star together in order to find out what their total distance or their relative distance from one another might be. And so when you're traveling around to try and get scan data on all the different stars, you run into this problem uh, and that, that we're, we're, you're trying to find the shortest route that you could take to get this work done in the least amount of time. They don't give you that information in game and there's a good reason for that. They call that problem the traveling salesman problem, because the problem has been around a long time. Uh, probably originated with traveling salesmen, uh, 100%. who had to go visit different cities in order to complete their route, and they would need to decide, in order to save gas and travel, how you know what cities to go visit first, and. Um, 
depending on which city you visit next, what's going to be the closest one? Are you going to end up going way out of your way at the end or somewhere along the, the line, uh, you know, in order to complete your route? What's the best way to do it? What's the best order to travel in? That's called the traveling salesman problem. And mathematically, I, I'm not a mathematician. 50%. I'm not a mathematician, but I've looked at this up, and that problem has the official name of the traveling salesman problem. There are several different mathematical solutions, but so far I haven't been able to find any that would um, be easy to use. The reason is, is almost every one of them uses what they call, ah, look at that, another terraforming candidate. Ha! Ha! Okay, and I'll bet you that that's probably that Earth-like world that we were looking at, but let's find out. System map. System map. No, it's this one here. Well, I thought this might be terraformable. We haven't even gotten to this guy yet. <laughs> this is a good system. I'm having a great time with this system. We'll get in close here and take a good look. So this has got a thin carbon dioxide atmosphere. And its dark color is probably because Engaged. it's got a lot of high metal content on it. Uh, unfortunately, it's not landable. I don't see water, but if it's there, it could be frozen water or um, you know, subsurface water, but again, that edge on look gives you kind of a sense of what the color of the atmosphere is. And again, that is kind of a, you know, a, a d kind of a brownish gray color. Okay, this is turning out to be a good system. All right, and this is the one that I've been waiting for. You see that silhouette on the left? that silhouette is for either an Earth-like planet or an ammonia world. And I'm kind of willing to bet um, that that is most likely an Earth-like world, but we'll find out when we get there. Maximum drive. Right now, the estimated system value you see okay, up top. Okay, fifty percent engaged. See up top is nine hundred seventy-four thousand four hundred eight credits, almost a million credits on this one system. And um, if it's a terra, if it's an Earth-like world, that's going to bring it up to almost fifteen hundred, but uh, one point five million. And we're gathering that scan data right now. So fingers crossed. It's an Earth-like world. Yes, indeedy. That was worth 641,000 credits all on its own. We'll go look at that up close. So as you can see now, my total value here is uh, 1,616,115 credits. Look at that uh, ice cap polar ice cap there. This is my fourth Earth-like world. 25, sir. And I'm going to put a note about that in my uh, ED discovery map here in just a moment. Okay, so this is a this is an Earth-like world. It's, we could just land on this world and uh, and just hang out. Breathable air the whole nine yards. Except, except for the game doesn't let you do that yet. Um, okay, let's check a little bit of the data about this. Uh, it's Earth masses. It's 0.42189 Earth masses. So it's roughly one half the size of the Earth. Um, 
Surface gravity is 0.79 g, so you'd be able to you'd feel um, about 20% lighter when you walk around on that planet than you do now. Uh, 401 days to orbit its star, so that's the basic period of the year. Uh, its rotation it takes 2.41 Earth days, so one day on Earth is about half, less than half of one day on this world. Um, the temperature is 267 degrees Kelvin. And if we go back here and enter in 267, well, we got to clear that first. Huh? 267, um, that would be average temperature of um, about 21 degrees Fahrenheit. So it'd be kind of cold. Of course, it would vary. <coughs> Excuse me. It would vary depending on on where you are. <laughs> I'm losing my voice. I'm talking too much on the planet. But the mean temperature is about 20 degrees, 21 degrees. Now I want to make an entry about this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up Captain's Log and right now I've currently got this planet selected. So Where's my mouse? Where's my mouse pointer? Where's my mouse pointer? It's not coming up. Okay, we're back and um, had a break. So I'm going to just continue in the system that we um, found this Earth like planet, you can see. And we've got a couple of um, uh, unexplored's left, I think, here. Three... Looks like we've got... Yeah, we just got three of them. So we'll select this next one. And... Big Super Cruise. Let's see where we are here. Full speed ahead. 100%. So this next one, based on the um, silhouette that we've got there, is going to be, um, uh, well that's uh, either a, let's see, that's either a high metal content or a rocky body. And let's verify that. So, just this one right here, and that is, uh, yeah, a high metal content or a rocky body. Let's get the scan data on this. System map. System cartography. Alright, so that's the moon for this Earth-like world. Close the map. Closing the map. Alright, and that's a rocky body. So, on to the next one here. This is going to be 570 light seconds away. Let's go get it. Now that um, that silhouette uh, is an Earth-like or rocky body, just like uh, the last one. We'll head that way. Let's confirm that assumption. There it is, Earth-like or rocky body. It could be either one, because it's between the the brackets for both the high metal content and the rocky body, so it could be either one. And sometimes it's hard to tell. You can look at the uh, the image on the system map. Let's take a look there. Open the map. System map. System map. So um, when we look at that image there, and zoom in a bit, Okay, so that's probably a rocky body, but um, let's see if we got any better pictures here. Any pictures that are representative of that? Well, not any exact matches, so we're just going to have to wait and see, I think.
the system. This is, I believe, our third system of the day, and we've already, this one alone is worth 1.6 million. It's really very good. Um, let's take a look down here, which is, accounts for almost everything that we've made, so. <laughs> There we go. High metal content. Another terraforming candidate. Ha ha ha. Ho ho ho. He he he. We've done very well today. Just on one system alone. We'll go take a closer look. So this has got a thin carbon dioxide rich atmosphere. So again, the, uh, the edge color when you're just looking through the atmosphere by itself should uh, be a um, kind of a grayish brown color which also accounts for the uh, the color of the the land masses most likely below the uh, between the, the poles what i'm going to do here is i'm going to swing around the back side so that we can see that edge color a little more clearly against uh, against the, uh, the brighter um, uh, background color there darker background colors. So now we can kind of... 25% engaged. Now, now we can kind of get a good good look. Let's try it along this aspect here. See what we can see. And there's a little bit of the atmosphere there on the edge that you can kind of make out. It's thin, you know, as carbon dioxide, but uh, yeah, it's a grayish color pretty. The graphics are going to get a lot better in the uh, in the new update that's coming out here in uh, less than a week now. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Down here. That's 12,943 light seconds away. A little bit of a trip, but that's all right. Maximum drive. So let's, uh, while we're waiting here, let's open system map. Open the system map. System map. System map. <laughs> I gotta fix this. Actually, um, HCS Voice Packs is getting ready to come out with a new update. It's supposed to be a major update that will uh, uh, better integrate with the voice attack software. So. Voice recognition hopefully will improve with that. I just wanted to take one last look at the whole system here, um, just to kind of, so that we can kind of get a, a larger heads up view. So when I looked at this system initially, and I saw all these uh, M and um, L class, this, this is an, uh, or a K and M class stars, I thought there could definitely be um, some, uh, some cool looking planets around here. Let's see if I can get that out of the way. Um, and then when I looked at the the color of the these guys up above here, um, I thought those are all going to be rocky bodies. And then I noticed that several of them um, were not landable, which meant that they had atmospheres. And then when I looked down below and I saw that blue earth-like looking world down there, I thought, oh my gosh, not to mention the fact that uh, most of those were not landable and therefore had atmospheres as well. So, um, you know, that's the reason that I had high hopes for this uh, going into it to begin with. And uh, so we're kind of closing the gap here. Not every system is going to be like that. I mean, you notice that the first two systems that we hit during the day, was it two or three? I forget. Uh, first two, yeah, because we're on our third one now. The first two that we hit um, didn't have much to offer at all. So, you know, it's kind of a hit or miss thing. Okay, uh, this uh, silhouette uh, down the bottom left, that's going to be a Sadarsky Class One gas giant. I know that one well, and uh, you can see the up at the top there the, the purple circle or the violet circle with the uh, Roman numeral one in it. That is 
a gas giant, a class one gas giant, typically they're always uh, listed as the Sadarsky class ones. So, yeah, so, you know, those aren't uh, nearly as valuable as the others, but still, I mean, it's worth 11,143 credits. You can see that there on the right. And um, sometimes they're, um, sometimes when you look at these, they're kind of a purple color, a like a deep purple, but uh, not this time. I guess there are reasons for that, but I'm not quite sure what those reasons are. Uh, there's a, there's one example at least of a class one Sadarsky gas giant. Yeah. Okay, so I believe we're now done with this system. Let's uh, take a look here and see. Uh, actually, I need to go here. And I'm just going to scroll through this list and see if I missed any. It'll be marked. Uh, unexplored, if so. Nope. Okay. Next waypoint.